Uh, years ago, when the draft was in vogue, a small fellow was drafted into the Marines and commissioned a second lieutenant. He was pretty ingenious despite his size. He sized up his platoon and uh, heard that they'd sacked three second lieutenants in the previous month. So he knew he had a lot on his hands. So taking a defiant stance, he challenged them. He said, I can lick any man in this room or in this group. Does any man here think he can lick me? I think I might be able to do it, sir, a large man in the back row said. What makes you think you're good enough? Maybe it's because I'm the heavyweight champion of the United States Marine Corps, sir. Good, said the second lieutenant, motioning him to come up. You're our new platoon leader. Now, can anyone lick me and our new platoon leader? I'd say that uh, lieutenant used his head. He was confident that he had, probably had the best fighting man in his group on his side now, so he felt pretty secure. However, sometimes being too confident may not end the way it did in this case, or for him, and instead can lead us um, into trouble. So what kind of confidence should we have? Turn to Daniel 6. I'm going to spend a little time on Daniel 6 this afternoon. I'm not going to read it verse for verse, but paraphrase some of it and read several verses. Anyway, Daniel 6, verse 1. It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom, the kingdom of Babylon, 120 princes, which should be over the whole kingdom. And in the next several verses, that also describes three, prince, uh, three presidents who were also to be leading uh, men for him. And it turned out that Daniel was the favorite. He was the one that the king looked to for advice. Now, this created a little problem, as we'll see going on, is because the other princes and the other presidents soon became uh, upset and jealous of Daniel's position. So they got together uh, and talked in verse 4. Then the presidents and the princes sought to find occasion against Daniel concerning the kingdom. They wanted to find out what he was doing to um, somehow harm the kingdom. Did it have something to do with the taxes, the finances? Was he taking bribes? Was he doing something that was wrong? But they couldn't find anything. It says they could find none occasion nor fault for as much as he was faithful. He was very loyal to the king, and when he had a job to do, he did it. He did it in the most effective and the most, most efficient way. And that was why the king favored him, because he knew if he had something to do that it would be done correctly and it would be done on time. There wouldn't be any feather bedding, there wouldn't be any work shorty or stopping or anything like that because Daniel had that under control. Neither was there any error or fault found in him. So as hard as they tried to find something to trip him up, they couldn't find it. However, they did discover something about him, something about his personal habits. And in verse 7, this was their way of dealing with that. This was their way of getting back at Daniel. Even though there was nothing to get back at, it was just a way of having him fall out of favor with the king, or so they thought. Verse seven, 
All the presidents of the kingdom, the governors and the 120 princes, the counselors and the captains. Now, here you have three other groups introduced. The first group was the prince, the 120 princes and the two other presidents, but now you have governors, counselors, and captains mentioned, and there's no number really uh, that you can know ascribed to them because there's not a number mentioned. But anyway, these were the movers and shakers uh, in the men. These were the important men. And anyway, it says they've consulted together to establish a royal statute. So they were trying to impress the king. And you'll understand why as we go on, along. He said, and to make a firm decree that whosoever shall ask the petition of any god or man for 30 days, save of thee, O king. And that's where they were flattering him. You know, you, you are the most important person in this kingdom. And we should be deferring to you. And we should look to you for your great wisdom. And so, in order to honor you, as it were, we think you ought to sign this, stating that no one in the kingdom is to consult with anyone else for the next 30 days, either God or man. And so, the king, without a lot of thought, probably thought, yeah, that sounds good to me. I mean, they're in a way recognizing me for my great wisdom, and they're honoring me by stating that no one else should be consulted during the next 30 days. I can go along with that. But he didn't really think about the ramifications of it. Now, there would have been a great temptation at that point for Daniel to go along with the crowd and to be popular. You know, he could have just quit praying for 30 days, or he could have closed his windows, he could have got under the sheets in his bed and whispered his prayers. That would have been real easy to do. He could have prayed in secret. It would have been so much easier for him to just fall in line with all of the men who had been responsible for this or promoting this statute. You know, I think we can all probably identify with this, not this specific um, story, but I think we can understand what it's like living in the world, because there are at times when it would be so much easier for us to cave in and to go along with the crowd. And this can take all kinds of forms regardless. I'm not going to try to go through and identify them all, but you all know them, everyone in this room. We've been in situations where there's been some kind of a temptation. And I'm not just talking about at work, but in your personal life as well. Very easy to just go along with the crowd. These influences happen to us on a daily basis. So what did Daniel do? What was his decision? Verse 10. Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, so he waited until he knew that decree had been signed. And according to the laws of the Medes and Persians, once it was signed, it could not be changed, it could not be amended, could not be revoked, it couldn't be annulled, it couldn't be destroyed, it was cast in stone. It could not be changed. Now, when he knew that it happened and that the penalty was to be thrown into the den of lions, he went into his house, his windows being open toward in his chamber toward Jerusalem, and he kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did aforetime. 
It was his habit. It was habitual. He did it like he did everything else in his life. It was a major, important part of his life, like eating and sleeping and drinking and any other thing. His prayer and his communication and his contact with God were more important to him than anything else. And regardless of the consequences of doing what he was going to do, had been doing, and would not, and would continue to do, uh, despite that decree, did not change his mind at all. And so you can guess who was standing outside the window listening because they knew from past experience and past observation what he would likely do. So when he did, they heard it, they went to the, before the king and told the king, you know, that law has just been signed and here is the first person that's violated it. Of course, the king was really upset. You know, he was standing or sitting there wishing that he'd never signed it, that he'd never seen that piece of papyrus or paper or whatever it was written on. But, as I said before, it could not be changed. It couldn't be revoked. He had no power to do that, according to the laws of the Medes and Persians. So, Daniel was put in the lion's den. Verse 18, Then the king went to his palace and passed the night fasting. Neither were instruments of music brought before him, and his sleep went from him. He was so upset about what he'd done that he fasted. He couldn't eat if he wanted to. Neither were instruments of music. You know, when you think about sometimes when you're trying to go to sleep, if you put on a certain kind of music, it will help you to kind of slow down and relax and help put you to sleep. Well, he didn't even call for instruments of music because he knew that that wasn't going to do anything for him. He was so upset about it. And his sleep went from him. And so verse 19, Then the king arose very early in the morning and went in haste unto the den of lions. And he said, Did your God save you? You know, are you all right? Are you okay? Verse 21, Then said Daniel unto the king, O king, live forever. You know, long live the king. Verse 22, My God has sent his angel and has shut the lion's mouths that they have not hurt me, for as much as before him I was found innocent. He knew I hadn't done anything wrong. And before thee, O king, have I done no hurt as well. I haven't been disloyal to the kingdom. I've always been promoting the good that you've done for the kingdom. I've always been enthusiastic about supporting you. I didn't do anything wrong. I've had, in fact, I've had a good night's sleep and I've used this lion's mane as a pillow. I just kind of sat down and relaxed and all these lions at first, I was a little concerned, but they didn't do anything. They mulled around, a few came over and sniffed at me, but when they lay down, I relaxed. I had a pretty good time, a good night's sleep. Yeah, I don't know about you, but how many times as a child would you throw your arm around your pet dog or your pet cat, and if you were on the couch or even on your bed, would put your arm around them and pull them close to you and doze off. It's easy to do. It's very comforting. It's comforting. There's something about that, the warmth of that animal being next to you. And as a child in particularly, I can remember sneaking cats 
or one in particular up to my room, which is upstairs. Dad had a, a rule, no animals in the house. You know, they had to be outside regardless of the weather. Well, I would sometimes bring the cat in and put my covers over my head and hope that he didn't hear it. But anyway, you know, small animals or big animals even have that effect. About two years ago, we have or had at that time three small dogs. And one was the mama of one of the ones we had. And she was having problems breathing. She was old and it was heartbreaking to watch her. Uh, one night Veronica woke me up and she said, we got to do something. And her name was Chewy and she was, had this look on her face like she was pleading with us. She couldn't breathe and she wanted us to do something. And I mean, it was just heartbreaking to watch her gasping for air. So we called around and found out there was a 24 hour clinic in Tacoma and we took her down there. And the vet examined her and then after running some tests said, well, you know, there's not a lot you can do. We can keep her in the hospital for another four or five days, but that's gonna run four or $5,000 and it's not gonna do anything. She's terminal. So tearfully, we allowed him to, or her to uh, euthanize her. So when we got home, which was about five or six in the morning, it was pretty much an all night affair, we put her son and licorice, the other little dog, uh, down in the bathroom where they slept. They had a little place where they slept down there. But when we went down to our room, which was at the other end, pretty soon they were whining and howling and barking because something was wrong. Chewy wasn't there. And that went on until we finally acquiesced and let them come down and sleep with us. But anyway, for the next month, it was like a morgue around that house. They didn't hardly bark. They didn't play at all, play together, and much, you know, they kind of picked at their food until finally they kind of worked their way out of it uh, and things started to get back to normal. You know, like they were before she disappeared from their lives. At that time, we should have put them back down in that bathroom. But now they're permanent fixtures on our bed. Each one has their own little blanket. And uh, Freddie uh, has managed to snuggle up to my back usually by the time morning rolls around. Anyway, the point is, as children, we do, when we got comfort from our pets, and in our case, our dogs got comfort from being with us. So doesn't it stand the reason that if you were thrown in a lion's den and there were tame animals around, and rather than being on the hard dirt floor, if there was one close by and it was convenient to throw your arm around him, wouldn't you? Take that as an option, you know, once you determine they weren't going to hurt you. Anyway, verse 23. Then was the king exceedingly glad for him and commanded that they should take Daniel up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den and no manner of hurt was found upon him because he believed in his God because he believed in his God. He knew God was going to protect him. God was going to take care of him. He didn't have anything to worry about. You know, when we go to the Feast of Tabernacles, uh, usually you hear Isaiah 11 read several times throughout the feast, where it says the lion shall eat straw like the ox and the little child shall lead them. Uh, and leading them, talking about not only lions, but other ferocious animals. So doesn't it stand the reason that if that's going to happen in the millennium, it would be a very small thing for God to shut the lion's mouths for eight or ten hours, however 
long people normally slept at that time. Anyway, verse 24, and the king commanded, and they brought those men which had accused Daniel, and they cast them into the den of lions, them, their children, and their wives. And the lions had the mastery of them and break all their bones in pieces or ever they came at the bottom of the den, literally pulverized their bones. I uh, ran a few calculations just to see how many people that would have been involved and how much food that would have been for the lions. And if you take 122 men times a weight of 150 pounds, that would be 18,300 pounds. 122 women, assuming they all had a single wife, um, times 100 pounds, I was very generous. Some of us would love to have that number ascribed to us now. And 122 pounds, uh, I mean 122 times 50 pounds for each child, assuming they all had one child. And I, you know, we don't know the exact figures, but this gives you a rough idea. 36,800 pounds or 18 and a half tons of food for however many lions were in that den. In Spokesman Club, we used to have a vocal exercise before we started club. Uh, one of them was how much wood can a woodchuck chuck if a woodchuck can chuck wood? How much meat could a lion eat if a lion did eat meat? And we know that they, they eat meat. Some field studies have estimated that they eat between 10 to 25 pounds of food every day. However, if they're out in the wild, it's not uncommon for them to, when they have a kill, gorge on that animal and eat up to 100 pounds of food and then fast for several days. And I'm thinking that since these lions were built, I mean, they were uh, in that den for specific reasons, like to take care of the type of thing we've discussed, they were probably pretty lean and mean. So, assuming that, that would have been with 36,800 pounds, 300, and 68 lions. And if you assume that maybe half of the food was bones or something they didn't care for, uh, you could cut that in half and that would make it 184 lions to take care of that many people. And if they did it in four shifts, 46 lions each. Now I don't know how they did it, but if you add all those people together, uh, they certainly had a method of doing it. Turn to Psalm 3, verse 3. Psalm 3, verse 3. But thou, O eternal, are a shield for me. If I'm in danger, you're there to protect me. You're there to take care of me. You're going to shield me, my glory, and the lifter up of mine head. So we don't have to walk around with our heads bowed over and have a hangdog expression. We should be positive. We should lift up our heads. And I don't mean in an arrogant, haughty manner but just positive about the future, positive about what God is going to do in our lives and has done in our lives and what he will do in our lives and not in despair or depressed. He is a lifter up of mine head. Verse 4, I cried unto the eternal with my voice and he heard me out of his holy hill. I laid me down and slept. 
I awakened for the eternal sustained me. I didn't have any anxious thoughts, as we're told not to have, for tomorrow, not to take, you know, it'll take care of itself. When you go to sleep at night, that's it. That's the end of the day. That's what God will do for you. I laid me down and slept. I awakened for the eternal sustained me. Verse 6, I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people that have set themselves against me round about. Even if the odds are ten thousand to one, I'm not going to be concerned. You know, David and Daniel had the right kind of confidence. What about us? We might be enduring our own personal den of lions right now, but we need to remember that our circumstances never are a reflection of how much God loves us. If we're having problems, that doesn't negate his love for us. We shouldn't put our focus on our problems, but on our all-powerful Heavenly Father. The question is, are we? Do we? Do we put our faith in him to rescue us? What is your, what is my, what is our collective den of lions? What form or shape has it taken? And or how does it appear? What are the odds against us? Make an estimate just for the fun of it when you think about it uh, and try to determine what they may be. You know, I'm not trying to oversimplify this or make it, you know, cavalierly not amount to anything, but uh, because sometimes the odds of one to one, a half to one, a quarter to one, a tenth to one can seem insurmountable. Turn to Hebrews 13, verse 5. Hebrews 13, verse 5. Let your conversation be, or conduct, be without covetousness, and be content with such things as you have. For he has said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. And one more time, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. When you have that kind of ironclad promise, then what do you have to fear? Who do you have to fear? And as a result, verse 6, so that we may boldly say, we may be confident and bold in what we say, not once again being arrogant about it, but being confident and bold because we know it says the eternal is my helper and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Turn to Psalm 27, verse 1. Psalm 27, verse 1. The eternal is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The eternal is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When I read this verse, I think of the beautiful song, and most of you have heard it at one time or the other since being in the church. I mean, I can... The melody is rattling around in my head right now, but I won't let it drop out. But it's a very, very moving, very beautiful song with a great meaning. It's very encouraging, and it lifts you up when you hear it. Verse 3, Though a host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war should rise against me, in this will I be confident. You know, North Korea can have all kinds of ICBMs directed at the Pacific coast, the Pacific Northwest 
in particular, since you have Boeing, you have Amazon, you have Microsoft, you have all of these very critical, very integral um, businesses that in the event of some kind of a major disaster or in the event of uh, a war would be very, very critical to the things that could be done. But even knowing that, and we don't know, I mean, we hear all the rhetoric going back and forth between our president and the North Korean president, uh, but we don't know exactly what they have. The United States Geological or yeah, Geological Survey research shows that Mount Rainier is one of the nation's most dangerous volcanoes. The west side of the mountain has the greatest potential for unleashing massive mudslides that, as they found their way away from the mountain, would either go down through the Puyallup River Valley or the Nisqually River Valley. We are 17 miles from the base of Mount Rainier. And so I'm thinking we'd have about as much chance if that mountain blew as Harry Truman and his 16 cats had when Mount St. Helens erupted. I mean, it's, it's not the type of thing you think about, but every once in a while, someone will say something about Mount Rainier. It's majestic, it's beautiful. But I can't begin to imagine what it would look like. And those of you who were around when Mount St. Helens blew and you saw all, all of the pictures and all of the volcanic dust in the air, uh, we had a little bit of a taste of what it might be like, only it would be many times worse than Mount St. Helens. Verse 4, one thing have I desired of the eternal, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the eternal all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the eternal and to acquire, inquire in his temple. And that's what we're doing today. We're inquiring in his temple. Someday we want to be in that temple. Verse 14, wait on the eternal. Be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thy heart. Wait, <clears throat> I say, on the eternal. You know, no matter what our den of lions is, and what form or shape it may take in our lives, we know and can know with absolute certainty that God will protect us and take care of our persecutors as well. You don't have to turn there, but you remember the account in number 16, what happened to Korah when the earth opened her mouth and swallowed them up, his family and their houses and all the men that appertained unto him and all their goods. God has a way of dealing with your persecutors. Or in 2 Kings 6, verse 17, where Elisha prayed so that the young men or the young man beside him um, could see why they didn't have to be afraid, where the Lord opened the eyes of the young man with him so he could see that the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire. How many of us have driven along 405 or I-5 or one of the major highways and we don't see an angel and a chariot going along beside us that maybe prevent us from having a major catastrophe or prevent us from being T-boned by another car? Now, I don't know in this day and age whether, you know, angels still use chariots and horses, maybe they use Maseratis or some other car to shield you. And, and you know, we can kind of laugh at that, but the reality is that's 
we have that kind of protection. God protects us. You know, we've just reviewed what happened to Daniel and have seen the example of the Israelites who applied the lamb's blood on the side posts and the upper door posts of their dwellings and were protected from death when the death angel passed over. And then shortly after that, we saw the seas part so they could escape the Egyptians and saw that same sea engulf the soldiers and chariots when the Israelites had safely crossed over. You know, it's appropriate to review how God delivered them as we approach the Passover. And finally, we see the example of Jesus who offered the supreme sacrifice willingly for each one of us. In five days, five hours, and approximately 10 minutes from now, we'll be here to observe the Passover. As we begin the spring holy days and the holy day season, let us make sure we have examined our lives. Have we relied on God's help and protection this past year when we needed it the most? You know, we don't need to have the United States Marine Corps heavyweight champion at our side because our Heavenly Father is always there. And if we really know and understand that he's always by our side, we will be able to have the right kind of confidence so that anything is possible. That if the heavyweight champion of the universe and or if you want to say it this way, the heavyweight champion of eternity is in our corner, we'll be able to overcome any opponent that comes our way. So to borrow a phrase from the Urban Dictionary, we should be able to say with all confidence, bring it on.